All right, bang, bang, it's Wednesday. It is June 9th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. Two guests today. I'm joined by a uh, frequent guest now at this point. Yeah, a couple times. Jeff D. Lowe of LCB, The Dozen, soon to be the uh, the new show that we're releasing. Yeah, Barstool versus America, yeah. Yeah, and then we have Richard Roper in here. Uh, Richard, thanks for joining. It's a thrill to be here. Uh, the fact that Jeff's a repeat guest kind of lowers the bar a little <laughs> bit, but uh, I'm, I'm going to stick I'm gonna stick around anyway. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. But, I didn't realize that he's like the first guest. In first this. guest. This is cool. First That's guest. A big yeah. Deal. So this was like uh, when Bill Murray christened Letterman's desk when they <laughs> went to late night TV and Bill came out there. I should sing physical and should have brought some spray paint. <laughs> Congratulations, though. By the way, yeah, this yeah. is. A, amazing so no thank you really thank you cool. so much and yeah that's what i said i was like jeff's gonna be in town jeff's our movie guy yeah. let's do it richard so uh Absolutely. thanks for coming in great timing happy to do it so i was gonna say uh film critic or movie critic what's what's the difference you know what you can say now is movie and tv critic because you know for folks who don't know you know i've been reviewing movies for 25 plus years now uh but about four or five years ago i saw the revolution coming with streaming i mean the streaming was around longer than that but in terms of just conversations you have with your friends, with your family at Thanksgiving or when you're hanging out, people would be talking a lot more, especially, you know, anybody that's you know, maybe 35 plus is talking more about, hey, what are you binge watching? What are you watching on Netflix? Mm -hmm. And then we had the advent of Disney Plus and Hulu and Amazon Prime and HBO Max. So what I do now is I still review feature films and uh, smaller independent films and documentaries, but I've added television shows to the mix uh so it's probably you know i'm still doing maybe 10 or 12 reviews every week and it's probably seven movies and five tv shows so be honest do you yeah. like that new wrinkle i love it i fucking love it really? because for one thing listen you know i've been doing this a long time and i'm all in on the marvel universe but there comes a moment the 37th time when they all got to get the one shiny thing that's going to help them stop the villain from ruling the multiverse. I mean, they're really, really well made, but, you know, mo movies are dominated now by the blockbusters. So what you see coming to, again, HBO and Showtime and all the streaming services are these great long form series. And way back in the day before your guys time. When a movie star went to TV, it meant their movie star career was kind of over. You know, they'd make that transition. You're like, okay, I mean, going all the way back to Lucille Ball, you know, she was in movies, then she did TV, and Henry Fonda and everybody else. Now you got Academy Award winning actors who love these streaming series because, you know, we just saw Kate Winslet, The Mayor of East Town, you know, great series. Everybody's talking about it. And she gets a chance to do a lot of acting that she doesn't get to do in feature films. So I actually love it. It's, it's kind of rejuvenated my interest in stuff because I've seen all the superhero movies. I'm still all for them. I love the big comedies. But these streaming shows, these limited series, and then all the true crime documentaries, which I really love, you know, the stuff that you get on Netflix and elsewhere. So I actually love it. Okay. And how does that make you feel, Jeff? You're the uh, Jeff's, Jeff's a big movie hero guy. Uh, yes, movie hero. Wait a second. You couldn't have sound less like you know anything about Marvel. Because I, I yeah, don't. Yeah, I mean, so like my desk at, at the <laughs> office back in New York, I have like five Infinity Gauntlets. I'm a, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. But also, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my TV at home above, I have like six Kurosawa movies, like Criterion. So like I'm uh, oh, yeah, I am you're a, a real weird. Movie buff, yeah. You know, I'm weird. And that's why I love both. But no, but that he, you're right. I mean, you are right. And that's also why Marvel, like I actually on the flight here, I watched, the, I got to see the first episodes of Loki. Yeah. Which were... I thought pretty awesome. I did too. I've been, I, yeah, I I've liked the first awesome. two Marvel uh, series for Disney Plus, but I've been a little critical of them. This one, I'm fairly fired up with. Yeah, I'm with you on that travel. Jeff. And, and, yeah, and and Tom Hiddleston, he's you know one of those things where I don't know if Loki was going to be that big of a character in the Marvel universe. You know, always was, but he's just elevated it. Uh, but but to what you were saying, listen. I've got a prop from the first Iron Man. It's not the, it's, it's one of the replicas that they use for Santa and stuff, but it's, you know, the, pa the package from Pepper, proof that Tony Stark has a heart. That's on my shelf in my home office. So I'm not trying to pretend I'm some snob here. And I still, I love the superhero movies, especially, you know, that when they infuse them with more than just the typical story. And that's what we've seen. There's a reason why you see, again, all these quality actors. First of all, it's a great paycheck and it's great exposure. But there's a reason Black Panther got nominated for Best Picture. That deserved to be nominated for Best Picture. There's a lot going on. These are our modern-day war epics as well. But again, 
with the streaming shows, you get to see more of these. I love like, you know, the undoing with Hugh Jackman mm -hmm. or, or uh, Hugh Grant and um, Nicole Kidman. And, you know, this murder mystery and everybody looks great and there's all kinds of tawdry going on. And there's always there's always some series. It's either, it's got to have either Reese Witherspoon or Nicole Kidman and they're really rich and somebody killed somebody and you know, all kinds of stuff. But it's great binge watching stuff. That, it's funny you say that, though, because you could even use that same logic with superhero stuff because i think the best superhero thing ever made now is watchmen hbo like i, yeah. I think H, like hbo yeah. watchmen is it's it's fascinating mind-blowing and there's just it could that it could never be made like that with a movie i mean That's zach snyder point. gave it his best best effort but like you that had to be done over that many episodes and that's just again like I I hate picking new things to be like my favorite things of all time because you just I don't want I don't like being the prisoner of the moment but Succession and Watchmen for me are two of my favorite things ever in any medium Jeff, that's period. A, that's so true about Watchmen, which also brought in all kinds of political and social and racial uh, historical context and and brought light to events that people might know not known about. And then of course there's this whole other element to it. But that's absolutely right. There are certain things that are going to work in a two-hour, mm -hmm. maybe a two-hour, 15-minute movie, and other things that need to breathe. You mentioned Succession. Unbelievably good show. And, it, and it's, it's built for that. And you can even go back to you know, Breaking Bad, which was kind of, right. you know, and Sopranos and things like that. And, you know, the, we, we get the movies sometimes, and we're going to get a Sopranos, not really, a, you know what it is. It's a, yeah. uh, The Many Saints of Newark. It's not really a, a prequel. It's about other characters. In, in, you know, Have you seen during, that yet? No, I haven't. No? It's, it's a couple of times it's been set up, and then they've delayed screenings of it. And those work, you know, and sometimes it's cool when they do the two-hour movie. But, like, a lot of times when they do the movie, I mean, I was a big Entourage guy back in the day. <laughs> I played me. And you were in it on Entourage, <laughs> but you know, and, it's, and, it, and you know, when you rewatch it now, it's like a lot of things. You're like, okay, it's very much of its time, but it's it's funny and it's great and it's you know, it's got a, a cool look to it. And then they did the Entourage movie, which was the biggest piece of shit, <laughs> and was completely <laughs> unnecessary and and lazy. And they just they just got everybody back together and said, let's do a movie, and didn't do anything with it. So sometimes I think it's just better to leave it, you know, let it exist and let it breathe. And and to your point, Jeff, about Loki, I think you know that's such a fascinating character, and to put the you know to to kind of show things from the point of view of the supervillain, because the villain never thinks he's the villain. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about it, that goes all the way back. You could talk about, you know, Shakespeare. I mean, the bad guy never thinks he's the bad guy. Uh, and Loki has his reasons for doing things, and we're seeing that. And from the start, even though we know he's probably going to let us down, he's the kind of character that you want to spend more time with. And you want to see things from his point of view instead of everybody always talking about Loki is what, is what happens in the Marvel Universe movies. Now Loki's front and center. Hey, let's take a quick break here to talk about TasteRealChicago.com. You guys see the beef kits, or if you're listening on audio, you guys know about the beef kits by now. We've been pumping it for the last month or so. Uh, TasteRealChicago.com, they got these beef kits. Also, if you don't want a beef kit, though, you can get the singular jars. You can get the mezzo air that's a medium blend. If you don't like it too hot, if you like it mild, this is right in the middle for you. So get some J.P. Graziano Jardinier or just get the beef kit, like I said. It's dummy proof. It's going to be a great gift for Father's Day. So if you don't want to go anywhere and if you just want to kick back, get that crock pot going, all you're going to need to buy is the meat and the buns. It's that simple. You'll need the meat and the buns. You'll have your beef kit ready for you. It's in stock, so go get it now. It's only going to take a, a couple of days to ship. So tastefulchicago.com. Go eat your beef kit. Go enjoy some uh, Italian beef. And, uh, yeah, tweet it at us, and we'd be happy to see it. So, tastefulchicago.com, one more time, go get your beef kit. Yeah. You said you said the prop thing with the Iron Man. Yeah. What's your one thing that you have where if, if, if a fire started, you're <laughs> grabbing it? Oh, you know, that's a great question. It's actually prop, you know, I mean, I got, I've got some cool props from things, some, some wardrobe items from different films, but... I think the one thing, you know, when I move from place to place and I've got a lot of stuff in storage and sometimes you're like, I recently found I had a signed photo from the cast of Coyote Ugly, uh, you know, Tyra Banks, Piper Parabo, you know, hey, Rich, you're a doll. The Coyote Ugly girls circa 2000. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm putting up that on the wall anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was on a, a, a TV sports show uh, maybe 15 years ago and they were doing a special on the best sports movies of all time which is always as Jeff mentioned it's kind of like people say what's your favorite movie what's your favorite sports movie well there it might depend on the season uh, the mood I'm in 
But I always have Rocky near the top of the list, you know, because when, when you go back and watch it to this day, it's such an original and it was an independent film. It was made for almost nothing, you know, and you guys know, probably know this story. Stallone's, they wanted to give him $350,000 for a screenplay. Hey, Robert Redford can play Rocky. Jimmy Kahn can play Rocky. Nobody knows who you are. And he, he, he stuck with it just like the real Rocky underdog story. So I said that about Rocky and I got a note from Sylvester Stallone mm. a week or two later on his personal note card and it's you know and you can almost hear his voice in the note you know <laughs> of course. Hey Richard I saw you said Rocky was the best sports movie of all time <laughs> I also think it's the best sports movie <laughs> of all time and then he puts a little jocularity there <laughs> which is just the kind of thing Rocky would say although he probably wouldn't use the word correctly like yeah, that yeah. And I've had that frame note from Stallone in my home office through about five different houses. That That's the one, you know, and when, when, especially when fans of the movie come over, I'm like, I'm not a big like, hey, look at this, look at this, you know, but I'm like, come and check this out. It's that's how you know, it's like the Bowflex yeah. machine. Yeah. If it keeps coming, if it keeps moving on and on, <laughs> yeah. like it's uh, Well, that's the clothes rack, yeah, though, exactly. the Bowflex machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, that's good. Uh, did, have you ever met him in person? Yeah, someone? yeah, a couple of times. Uh, we've never done, I've never had a chance to really sit down with him, which I would love to do because, you know, you look at that career and what he's done. You know, there's interesting, there was a, a documentary recently, I don't know if you guys had a chance to, there was one uh, on Frank Stallone, who's had this very interesting life, you know, his I brother. I need to see you that. You gotta though. see this. And it's, it, the documentary is trying to make the case that Frank Stallone is a true talent and just has always been in his brother's shadow. And the, the, uh, the evidence they provide is that he was in Rocky, and then he did the soundtrack for Staying Alive. In other words, everything he's done is because of his brother. So it doesn't really make the <laughs> argument. But one of the coolest things is they interview Frank Stallone in his, in his house in L.A. And it's a, it's a nice house. You know, he's, he's cracked out a living. He does, you know, musical appearances and whatever. And then they interview Sylvester Stallone. And he's in this gorgeous, it looks like, you know, Jeff, you're in New York. It looks like the most beautiful Irish bar in Manhattan, you know, the rich wood paneling, the incredible array of, of bottles and liquor and the taps with like 20 different kinds of beers. And he's sitting on the stool there and I'm watching this interview. And then I realized there are also like Academy Awards in the background. And I realized this is his home bar. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> this is Sly's home bar. And I'm like, I got to get there and have a sit down with him. So I've been actually efforting that in recent months. Uh, I would just love to just sit down with him and do like a career retrospective. Talk about all his work. He my my last ever worked for Good Morning America. So I was mm -hmm. always there okay. when they yeah. get shuttled in and out. And he was he's the, the one I always tell story wise where uh. he just stayed. He just kind of he got off set. And he just kind of stood there. Because he knew people would want to meet him, and he just he's like, "Hey, how you doing?" Took pictures with everybody, off, and then just like story after story with everybody. He was there for like forty five minutes. I they had to be like, you have to leave. "You're on a live set. Like you got you got to get out of here now." Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he he lives up, which is that's one of those where, which I don't know if that's the case for you, but that's one of those. There's a couple people for me. Like, look, if some if I meet a celebrity, we interview someone, and they end up being kind of crappy. It just yeah, and it doesn't bother me. But there's a few where you really. You, you yeah. want them to be, you want yeah. them to feel like like Julie Andrews walked on set, and I was like, oh wow, that's like royalty, and it should, she was right. truly that nice. I was yeah. like, okay, I love to hear that. Yeah, uh, I'm sure your your experiences are pretty much similar. I've found through the years uh, that most cases, the bigger the star, the nicer they yep. are, because they've gotten to a point. And someone likes Stallone, they recognize and know they're aware of the effect they have on people. So if someone wants to sit there and tell them how much Rocky meant to them, even though. He's heard that a million times. He's gracious about it. I have had some encounters, you know, with someone who's just coming up mm -hmm. and they think they've reinvented acting. You know, they've yeah. got three or four roles. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes I've met them 15 years down the road and, and, and they're a lot nicer. But, you know, speaking of, of you know, the talk shows, uh, when I was you know, making the rounds one year and I was doing it was it was uh, Regis and Kelly at the time, uh, Kelly Ripper with uh, Kelly Rip Kelly Ripper. All of a sudden, I'm, <laughs> I'm one of the Wahlbergs. I don't know. And Kelly Ripper. Uh, and, and Regis Philbin. And, you know, same kind of thing. For me, it was always a thrill. I'd be doing this with Roger Ebert or, or solo guest host or guesting thing. And you'd be, I always like, who's going to be on the show? You know, and Will Smith would always be so nice. Or mentioned Reese Witherspoon. And I was backstage one time and there was this unbelievable entourage. In fact, it looked like entourage, you know, publicists with, with clipboards and headsets. And it wasn't the staff of the show. It was this person's team. And they were all like, you know, we're going to pull the limo in the garage so that the fans outside don't mob her and this and that. And I'm thinking at the time, I'm thinking, who could this be? It's going to be Mariah Carey. It's going to oh, be no. Madonna. <laughs> Who's it going to be? 
And it was um, Lauren Conrad from The Hills. Oh, oh no. my God. That's, that's who it was. Who came yeah. in flanked yeah. by like 15 people. And, you know, she was perfectly nice and lovely. But, yeah. And I had no fucking idea who that was. I did not watch, you know, spoiler alert. You know, I, 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 I don't know all the people. I know, I know KCAV. I love Kristen Cavallari because <laughs> we got to see Jay Cutler on a reality show, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. But it was incredible. And I just, and I thought... Okay, she's a reality star. You know, you can say what you want about that, but think about someone whose job is to be the second publicist for the reality star yeah. and thinking you're badass. Like, hey, everybody, can we clear out the makeup room? We need yeah. it. You know, she's going to need some alone time to meditate. I go, before she tells an anecdote about lip gloss to Regis <laughs> Philbin? So there you go. No, the, I think there's something. The to entourage that. stuff is, is one of my more favorite. Like, just to see who travels with who. Yeah. Who t how they talk to their entourage. I don't mean like if they treat them poorly, but if they're like, no, let me. And like a lot of the time, the entourage people, you know, like it's their job to be the mean people. Yeah. Like, that's why yeah. they're there. It's for sure. But there are some, like, we had we had a big snowstorm, I think right around the time Southpaw was being was starting to make the rounds to their press tour. And I remember mm -hmm. Jake Joan Hall walked into Times Square like by himself. Yeah. Like he just he just was like he's like, Hey, I'm here for the interview. And I'm like, I'm like, what you you know, Jake Joan Hall. Like you know, everyone never knows everyone Yeah, I'm Jake and you're yeah. like, yeah. No shit. Yeah, he's right. got like snow yeah. all over him, like I didn't come That's up in a nice. car. Yeah. So the entourage stuff is it, the biggest entourage I ever saw was Rihanna. Yeah, and that, I do I think, think you get that. People. Yeah, and I, I think overall you'll see that probably more in the music world because there's even more of an, you know, actors at least have to work with other people on movie sets. And yeah, they can hide in their trailers and stuff, but they, you know, a lot of them will interact with the crew and they have to work in ensemble situations. You're a music superstar. You can really be insulated from any of the r real world concerns that exist. And kind of start to think of yourself as that person who's on the stage and not the person who's off stage, you know, the other 22 hours of the day. So I, I, I can see that. But I, yeah, I've seen the same thing, too. McConaughey is a guy that always used to just walk in, mm -hmm. you know, for his guest shot. And, and, you know, that's the thing, too. And you're in New York. You know this. And Chicago has a lot of celebrities, not nearly as many as Hollywood. I think, of, but especially in New York, if you don't act like. You're the world's biggest celebrity. Yeah, people are going to say something here and there, but you can live. You can live a life. You can yeah. live a life if you want to. Totally. I remember the same thing with Stern. Uh, some when I was there, someone who said, the, oddly enough, Floyd Mayweather was the guy who oh, wow. rolled with like a million people. <laughs> that <laughs> that could, I also believe. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, boxers too. Again, you know, not a team sport. Yeah, well, exactly. and a lot of athletes, unfortunately, as you guys know better than I do. You know, you, they get caught up in that and their generosity is their biggest weakness because every cousin, yeah. every neighborhood, you know, guy that grew up with them and everything ends up on the payroll doing nothing but taking money. Totally, totally. And, and you, you talked about superheroes. What about sequels and remakes? Where are you, where are you at on those? You kind of... Well, uh, <laughs> sequels, you know, you guys know this rule. The third one is usually where it falls off. And the reason that rule exists is because it's true in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Now, recently, you know, we got A Quiet Place Part 2. I thought it was great. I liked it I quite a bit. I thought they did a great job because Krasinski is the writer-director. You know, first of all, we got the prequel, spoiler alert. So we got to see day one and what happened, which yeah. was a thrilling sequence at the beginning when you mm -hmm. see the last vestiges of normal life. But then he brought it outside. He didn't just repeat himself. And you look at a lot of the sequels that have come down the pike through the years, they're usually pretty solid. It's when you get to the third thing. But the other thing, the other thing, Eddie, that I'm not a huge fan of is reboots and remakes, yep. you know, and they're starting to now do movies from when I started as a critic, not even from when I was a kid, but movies, I, you know, and they just announced, you know, the whole Police Academy franchise is going to be rebooted. There was I'm another like, one I just yeah. saw the other day was like, that came out like eight years ago. Yeah, they're, they're, you know, well, it, well, and listen, even in the superhero genre, we've had nine Spider-Men, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think actually each one, they did a better job. Uh, you know, the, the middle one in particular where it was it Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone were 30, you know, and they're, they're playing the high schoolers. It was like Greece when, yeah. when the teachers were 70 <laughs> and the students were 40. Uh, but, you know, and then this other trend of you know, bringing back these television shows. Now, I think like, for example, when they do the one-offs, like the All in the Family ABC special was pretty cool, you know, and they're doing the actual scripts and they got Woody Harrelson and Marissa Tomei and these great actors. But when, you know, you're bringing back uh, Blossom, or some of these other shows and catching up with these characters. 
that's the one thing I'll, I'll say in defense. The Friends reunion, I thought, was kind of a strange, you know, this hybrid. Absolutely strange. Because uh, all of a sudden you had a fashion show with Justin Bieber modeling costumes from, from the thing. And then you'd have guest stars coming in. Tom Selleck looked like he didn't want to be there. Like he was <laughs> like he had like they had dragged him off the set of Blue Bloods, put him on a plane. And he was like, am I in character as Richard? Do I hate Chandler? What am I fucking doing here? Uh, but at least we didn't pick up the stories of Joey and Monica and yeah. Chandler at the age of 50. And, you know, Seinfeld has, has famously said this, as you guys know. He goes, no, we're never going to bring back that show. Because how sad would it be if Kramer was living across the street from Jerry, or across the apartment hall from Jerry and they're 65? The know? circumstance is obviously different. But we just talked about, about this a couple weeks ago. They, Seinfeld, ended up having the best thing ever with the Curb yep. season. That yep. was just a, a season of reunion, which, again, that's a circumstance that is so yeah. niche and unique yeah. but the fact they did it, it did feel like a reunion they made yeah. fun of it it was meta and then it kind of just you know that's th that's that's absolutely right larry david got his do-over and uh, you talk about great shows too you know curb your enthusiasm it's like what 10 seasons but it's 20 years because he does them you know every other year the early seasons right? i just it, watched amazing. one where they couldn't board a flight because they didn't have their plane tickets <laughs> i mean think about <laughs> that, that. Yeah. yeah hey everybody let's take a quick break here and let's talk about our friends at roman you guys know about the swipes by now it is the best way to last longer in bed it's actually a clinically proven way backed by science and shit clinically proven that's what that i think that's what that means regardless it's clinically proven as a way to last longer in bed. Stop using the old tricks. Stop thinking about, oh, they got a uh, uh, Chicago guy's got a new office. You know, I'm sitting there thinking about all oh, the new podcast does this and that. Don't do it anymore. You don't need to do it. And the best part about these Roman swipes are shipped to you in discreet, unmarked packaging. So nobody will ever know you got it. OK, so you can have this nice little trick there for you and nobody has to know except for you to get your hands on these. All you got to do is go to get Roman.com slash walk. And you can get your first month of swipes for just five dollars when you choose a monthly plan. That's getroma.com says walk, go do it, enhance the sex life, people. You got nothing to lose. I know you got nothing to lose. You know you got nothing to lose. So go do it. Getroman.com says walk. We love Roman. Go support Roman. Go get some swipes and enhance your sex life. All right, let's get back to the show. But what I oh, love fun. about Curve is that he has found this cast of people playing themselves, but we just talked about like, you know, super nice people. And you get people like Ted Danson, who's an absolute <laughs> sweetheart, and he plays like a pompous ass version of Ted Danson. And then he got Lynn Manuel Miranda, who might be the nicest, sweetest, most generous man in the history of show business, to play the asshole version of Lynn Manuel Miranda on the show and Schwimmer and all these other guys. So that's another, you, you mentioned meta and all that, and that stuff sometimes can be a little too coy and clever, but not in Larry David's hands. It's brilliant. I think it, Curb at this point might even be a better show than Seinfeld in terms of something that you want to watch over and over. Curb's last season just ripped every week. It was, it was, it was amazing because there was a season a couple years ago where I thought it was funny, but may it had, it's like, oh, maybe, yeah. but then this, yeah. it was my, it, going back to the sequel thing, mm -hmm. we talk about this now and then. So we, I, it's something I like doing more until we started doing guest interviews in the last couple of years because mm -hmm. I always... I still have that in my head, and I'm sure for you, it's it's nothing. You've been doing this forever, but it, you hate giving a, a rating and like a score to something. That you're like, oh man, you work so fucking hard on that. Like, it's like yeah. I could never yeah. do that. But yeah. for me, I also get a little critical when there's reasons to dislike sequels and reboots and remakes as well. And like, yeah. I get caught up in that as well sometimes. Like, because we we go we go at a scale of zero to hundred. I love I love giving movie ratings. The website yeah. literally based on it, but. I also, like, again, because I do it, but I get critical, like, Corella, for example. I don't love hating on a movie just because it is a reboot or because I do think they can be yeah. decent. Now, I don't think Corella should go win an Oscar, and I don't think it's that of May, but I thought for what it was, like, okay, no, that was fine. I yeah. And I actually felt it was not, yeah, maybe it wasn't necessary, but I'm not going to crap on it because they didn't need to like just because they didn't need to make it they don't need to make any sequel. that's true right? well like, they never I, need yeah. to make empire strikes but like it, they can still be good so that's what's kind of frustrated me with these with, with some of them recently because a lot of the remakes and sequels have been really bad well one of the things i try to keep in mind is exactly that you know to just say that a sequel or a prequel or a reboot isn't as good as the original is not film criticism it's just saying right. you like the original better well so what? You know, probably we all did. And in the case of Cruella, you know what? I, I actually, I, for what it was and what it has, it's got a great look. Emma Stone and Emma Thompson are great together. But, you know, one of the things I point out about, about that particular 
prequel, I guess you would say, Jeff, is that it's a prequel to 101 Dalmatians. There was a 1961 animated film, and then the 1996 live action film. Have you ever met anyone who's ever said my favorite Disney movie is 101 Dalmatians? <laughs> no. It's lower tier Disney. I mean, you know, the, the whole plot with Cruella DeVille is that she wants to get 101 Dalmatians to skin these dogs and make a coat out of them. And spoiler alert, Disney will kill off parents and Bambi's, you know, you know parents and things like that. They're not going to skin dogs in a movie. So we know it from the start. But I mean, can you even name? Because I can't like. Who's the hero in 101 Dalmatians? Who, who, yeah. who thwarts Cruella de Vil? So seeing her origin story to me is more interesting than this wacky old lady that wants to make a dog coat. Well, she's a top tier villain, for, I would say. Cruella like, is a top tier yeah. villain. I mean, the song, you know. Well, yeah, well yeah, that's yeah. A, that's, that, Eddie, that's a great point because how many Disney movies are named or, you know, known for the villain first? There are a lot of famous villains, but yep. they're not. And that's because the rest of the story and the heroes are bland and forgettable. So I think... When someone you know endeavors to do a prequel or origin story that it that, and again, does it stand alone? Yes, you don't really need to know the story of 101 Dalmatians. It helps, but it's just yeah. It, it, to me, it had a great eye popping look, and just in terms of when you mentioned how people worked hard on a film too, and and in the interview situation, one of the reasons I've always done a limited amount of interviews is I didn't want to get in that situation where I'm interviewing everybody as they did on Good Morning America or doing the Today Show and all the TV reporters. and Because then they're always going to say they love the movie, whether they not to, do, did or not. So when I'm offered an interview with anyone who I might be interested in talking to, the publicists from all the studios know, show me the movie first. If I really didn't like the movie, if there's not much I can find, then I'm not going to do the interview. Yeah. Because they're thinking, oh, Richard Rubber, the film critic, is going to interview me. He must have loved the movie. And then, you know, you don't want to talk to somebody about their process and working with this actor and getting into character and then give it one and a half stars, totally, you know? Totally, So I'd rather just, in those cases, just review the film. We've, we, we're still learning that. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, it, you know, it's, it's tough it's, to navigate. You feel, because so we almost never do them after the fact. Almost never. Uh, and we, we were on a, a fairly long streak for the mm -hmm. last two months where everybody we interviewed, we turned around and reviewed the movie next week. And we're like, oh, uh, man. Yeah. Oh, boy. And we, I mean, we watch them, too, but it's like, ah, uh, you just, you do feel. But I, I, but again, going back to that one more time, I, I like that you say that because that's my thing. I think it's become a lazy, easy trope to just say it's not good because it is a sequel. Yeah. Which yeah. is just, it's not, that's because, like, there are very big reasons. Like, one of the worst movies in the last five years that I saw was the remake of, um, what was the remake? The Hustle. It was the remake of um, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, right? The one with oh, God, yeah. Anne Hathaway and Rebel Wilson. Oh, it was astonishingly, and, and jaw-droppingly horrible. They replaced the, the <laughs> scene where he's in the wheelchair and they hit his knees and he's trying to make uh, Steve Martin like react, but he yeah. has to pretend. They replaced it by pretending... Uh, I, I, Anne Hathaway's character was blind, and Rebel Wilson had French fries and and rubbed the inside of the toilet with them. Which I I love a good poop and piss humor. Like the next, <laughs> I, I mean that is, I love it, but that is just like that's. So there are enough reasons in these bad sequels oh, yeah. to not just say, oh, it's bad because it's a sequel. No, it's bad because she it's was rubbing French movie. fries in the toilet. Listen, like, uh, yeah. You know, the, the same thing with the, uh, now we're going to get it, you know, we're going to get another, a, more of a spiritual sequel to Ghostbusters. But when they did the remake with the all-female cast, which is an awesome thing, and it was, you know, the great actors who were in it, but the movie was god-awful. <laughs> it was so dopey bad. and lame. And, and, and Paul Feig, who did it, you know, has done... Uh, he started Malcolm and uh, uh, Freaks and Geeks and, yep. you know, Bridesmaids. He's a terrific filmmaker and a great guy. Great. Yeah. And I, you know, I think I gave it one star and I, I did hear from him. He's like, oh, you know, I, my heart just fell a little when I saw your review. And I, I said, I go and he talked about how, you know, how hard it was to get the all female cast and everything. And I said, Paul, I respect all that. But I'm reviewing the movie for the people that are either going to go to the theaters or pay for it on streaming video. Yeah, Because then said, you lose your people coming to review. But see, that's got to yeah. be that's gotta be God, tough yeah. for for yeah, you yeah. though, because for me, I'm, I'm, you know, we're nobody. Like whatever. Like we're nothing. Mm. Maybe there's a friend that we'll have that makes a movie. But yeah. for you now, like you've, like you're on the like the DVD cards, the Blu-ray cards, like the posters and stuff for the good stuff. So that's got. There, yeah. Have you well, have you had it start to hijack your quest? No, 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 no. I, there's got to be every once in a while. Maybe that is one of them where you're like, oh shit. Oh, there's there's <laughs> more than some. And you know, like well, I'll go back and I'll tell you a story. Uh, my late great partner, Roger Ebert, because when Roger was first come up, coming up too, it was in an era where, you know, he would write pieces for like Esquire magazine. He'd spend 
two weeks on the set of a movie with Robert Mitchum, you know, or and really get, or, you know, and have dinner with Newman and Redford while they were making Butch and Sundance. So, and he became great friends with the uh, legendary director, Robert Altman. I mean, like going on vacations and stuff. And Altman told him during the course of their friendship, you know, if you never gave me a bad review, why would I respect the good ones? And that was kind of the way, and, and I'll name drop and say, I had the same conversation with Nicolas Cage. He, he was doing a movie called The Weatherman in Chicago, where we're at, uh, which is actually kind of a cool movie, because it's so great, because he's the worst weatherman in the world, and people are always throwing shit at him <laughs> on the streets of Chicago, because he's walking through the snow, and people are saying, 55 and sunny, really? And throwing <laughs> ice balls at him and stuff. Uh, and he's a fascinating cat, and has done some of the best and some of the worst performances we've ever seen in modern history, right? <laughs> but the same thing, we had a dinner, and he said to me, he goes, I know you're gonna give me more bad reviews and more good reviews down the road, and let's just toast to that now. That's why I, I care what you say. But that being said, there's still moments where, you know, I've gotten to know some directors and some actors really well, and it's, it's yeah, you think about it, but you know, and sometimes I don't hear from them for a long time. I once, uh, Sean Penn once uh, directed a movie called Into the Wild uh, with Emile Hirsch. It's a good film. You know, it's based yep. on the true story of this kid that wants to have a year and get away and he goes into the wild and unfortunately, like, he's not equipped for it, right? And I gave it three stars out of four, 75 out of 100 on Jeff's scale, right? That's a recommendation. Yeah. And I went on TV and I said it was a good film. And Sean Penn's publicist or whoever called and said, hey, Sean Penn wants, Sean wants to talk to you. He actually wants to write you a letter. He, does, he doesn't believe in email because people can alter emails. So can you get to a fax machine? This was not that long ago. <laughs> you know, you could still, you didn't have to go to an auction oh, I love to that. get a fax machine. You know, yeah. somebody in the office still had one, you know, Miriam down in printing or somebody, you know, in the cellar. And he sent me a three and a half page uh, fax disagreeing with my review and arguing and I gave it a positive review but he oh was God. disappointed it didn't get four stars mm. and he went you know and he said what about this and did you think about that and you know I first of all I admired his passion and it was very Sean Penn of him but I was like dude I liked the movie I'm thinking like did he send eight page faxes to critics <laughs> that didn't <laughs> like it you know and it was like I'm sort of like you know listen I've got a pretty big ego but it shouldn't matter that much to you yeah. you know three and a half pages geez so is there any actor that completely ices you because of a review? Uh, yes. Uh, there have been a couple of cases. I'll tell this story because I've told it before. Uh, I was doing The Tonight Show. Roger and I were doing the uh, guests on The Tonight Show, and uh, Ben Stiller was on. And I know Zoolander has become a huge cult film, but I did not love the first one. The second one I thought was a disaster. But I think I gave maybe two and a half stars to the first one, sort of a mild, hey, it's got a great concept, you know, didn't love it. So backstage at the Tonight Show, they have all these guest books. Anybody who's ever on their side, and there's like, you know, dozens of them. It's real cool because you can pull out, hey, wow, 1984, Eddie Murphy's first appearance, and he put a little note in there and everything. So the producer comes backstage. Hey, guys, so good to have you on the show again. Ben Stiller is going to be on. He's in the other dressing room, and we're like, okay, didn't love his movie, but lo I love him. You know, I think he's done a lot of oh, great yeah. work. And they, they go, hey, we got the, the guest book here for you guys to sign. So... Roger grabs the guest book and he looks at me and he had this movie kind of just raise his eyebrows like a cartoon character, like, come take a look at this. And instead of saying, uh, you know, to Jay Leno and the Tonight Show, producer, Tonight Show producers, I'm so glad to be on the show again, Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller wrote, to Ebert and Roper, why don't you take those two thumbs and shove them up your ass? <laughs> So I guess he hadn't gotten over it, you know? <laughs> and then uh, he, he was on first and he left before, he wouldn't come on with us, you know? Really? And we later heard from him and he goes, I'm sorry, because he's a, he is, a, I know he's a sweet guy. I don't know him, you know, per se, but it, you know, he's got a great reputation and very generous person. And he just said, you know, I, I, I'm sorry I had that reaction, but I, I spent four years of my life working on that movie. And, Roger said, well, we spent 90 minutes sitting through it. So, you know, let's call it even. He was a little harsher about that stuff sometimes than I was. But, you know, I, I, I get that. And, and Jeff, you know this too. Nobody sets out and says, let's make a shitty movie. Maybe, maybe Adam Sandler when he's got his 15th, you know, comedy with his buddies. He knows it's not going to be an Oscar winner. Yeah. And I've got relatives who work in the movie business, you know, and on crew and props and things like that. And lots of friends who work behind the scenes, screenwriters who work for 15 years on a script and then it finally gets made. So I get that. Everybody works hard at what they do. But again, you know, I always looked at my mission. It's the final product. I know everybody went into it with great intentions. Is it something the average working man or woman should spend their money on? End well, of story. Yeah, that's yeah. who you owe it to, right? right. Like they're yep. the ones buying the papers that yep. you're and they're the ones going to the website. So yep. 
That's totally, totally. Is there a movie? And it's interesting too, because our boss, he writes pizza. I don't know if you've ever oh, seen Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, all the time people come it's up to It's one of the few him. jobs that I look at and go like, what a cool job. <laughs> yeah. Because all I hear from people is you watch movies and you get to write about them. I'm like, yeah, it gets a little more complicated. I'm like, pizza. No, I love that. Yeah. Exactly. But you know what I mean? Same thing. Like I've been with them so many times. People are like, hey, really, man? Yeah. Seven one here, you know? And, uh, and <laughs> yeah. is there any movie for you that you feel like people come up to you more than others and be like, hey, Richard, well, this one, like really come on. Is there any one that people are kind of the most ticked yeah. at that you kind of docked? Uh, yeah, and it's you know it's generational. It depends yeah, on yeah, yeah. at different points in my career. Um, when the Lord of the Rings franchise first started, I had not read. I mean, I know about Tolkien and I know about the books, but and listen, I thought it, you know it became this legendary franchise. But the first one to me, I was sitting in the theater and it was like three and a half hours of elves and precious and you know goblins and shit and this and i for me it was just like we're gonna see like nine more of these you know so i i did not give a positive recommendation to the first lord of the rings movie and i heard from people about that for a very very long time i eventually that did kind of come around and i went back and i've, I've watched it and it, you know it's a really really well made film and the other thing is uh, it's it's the star wars universe i'm probably more generous than Jeff might be or other fans because I've never been I listen I, I recognize its place in movie history and especially the originals and all of that it's not my favorite genre you know the, the, and, and I am not combing through the fan fiction sites and the Twitterverse and everything else about every spinoff and different casting of characters and how this thing so there have been some of the more recent films that people hated like they hated a country they're at war with i mean you know the visceral level of dislike for some of these films and sometimes i'll say listen it's a it's a cowboy pop opera set in space i don't know if it's completely in tune with the rest of the universe but i give it three stars and then i'll hear from them like you're unfit yeah last jedi, jedi. Was, <laughs> yeah was the, were you at did you did you go to the last jedi premiere in california and in la i don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I, that I that was my parting gift when I was at Good Morning America. I got to go because I'm I'm a Star Wars super fan. Yeah. It you would have thought that movie was gonna win an Oscar and he left that theater. Not a fucking soul wow. disliked that movie, and then it became the most yeah. divisive Star Wars movie ever made. But Star Wars is I almost hate talking about my office at home is lined with Star Wars action figures from my childhood. Mm. Like I obsessed. I almost hate talking about it at this point because yeah. where Marvel has become such an easy discussion and for the most part everyone loves yeah. star wars it's just always filled with some form of hate on one side or the other and yeah, it gets it's so true. ugly i mean actors have left social media and almost yeah. left acting because of the reaction to their performances which is you know these fucking people sometimes i mean it's like you're just being cruel and it's easy and we know, all know about you know social media bullying but it's so true I, I see some of that stuff. I almost never engage. I'll engage with film fans on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook or anything who want to have a discussion. Hey, Rich, love your reviews, but I think you're way off on this or that. And I'll say, hey, why would you think that? Or thanks for your input or something. But when it just comes to like, you know, die. I, I read your review, die. And I'm like, well, thank you. Have a fine <laughs> yeah. day. And Jeff is absolutely right. You get that in the Star Wars universe. And I'm like, I wish... Uh, you know, there was a, a, a Goodfellas universe where there was that much passion, <laughs> yeah. but nobody hates on it, I guess. But yeah, and, and just when they announce casting decisions for the next chapter and people go nuts and they go, but in the original comic book, he was part Icelandic and his DNA was this. And now, and I'm like, it, you're talking about something based on a comic book. You know, they get, re or, and this is another thing that drives me nuts is when uh, people go nuts over a trailer. And they say, this trailer, we're, you know, we're doomed. And I'm like, you want to talk about looking at the trailer? Look at the trailer for the original Star Wars. I'm sure you've oh, seen yeah. it many times. It looks like the worst TV show of all time, <laughs> not the worst movie of all time. And trailers could be nothing more than misleading, including a lot of horrible comedies where they take the only 90 seconds that are funny. Yeah. And then I'll hear from people, well, but that looked really funny based on the trailer. And I'm like, well, the menu looks really good based on the pictures and the laminated things. It like means they food? did their job then. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, they, they, they marketed it well. What a shock. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you always strive. I noticed when it comes to Star Wars, you're always like, it was fun. 
It was fun. Yeah, because well, the, I mean, I I liked the Last Jedi. I liked it a little less after the premiere. And premieres are tough because you're you're put into an environment that is yeah. you're meant to like it. It's magical, especially yeah. a Star Wars movie, which yeah. is in this. It was in a massive theater on USC's camp. It was just it was crazy. So I I, I still do like the Last Jedi quite a bit, but Star Wars, yeah, it's it. It broke me a bit, but it's funny because you know what it goes back to. It's like, what's the one Star Wars thing that everyone agrees they love? And that's, again, it's a series. It's The Mandalorian. Yeah. You get to, you get to yeah. go back and do kind of what Star Wars used to always be. Less about the universe. Yes. Which, again, there's, I mean, a fucking Luke Skywalker did show up, yes. But more about, like, kind of the grittier stuff that got people into it yep. so many years ago. So it had, again, yeah, it actually had that kind of cinematography and the camera angles yeah. and everything where they are clearly... Paying tribute to that, and that that was very cool. And again, worked much better than it would have as a two-hour movie. It's just the the, the hate. It's like it's incredible. There's a lot. I, cr- I I I collected the action figures as a kid. Like that's what that's what I think. When <laughs> well, I think Star Wars, yeah. I think of that. I, I I can't. I just we don't like on our pod. We just don't talk about it much anymore because it just it's all you can't win. You, yeah, you're you never can't. gonna. No one ever says you changed my mind about the Empire Strikes Back. Now yeah. that now because of what you said, and that's the thing too. I like what you said about you know it's fun. Because you gotta, when I review movies too, they're they're not just one movie compared to another movie. Because right. someone will say, "Why did you give this three and a half stars?" and then you gave that three stars, and I'm like, "What did the movie set out to do? What did the filmmakers want to do? What was the intention of the film?" So when you see, you know, there's a there's a film on Netflix right now called "The, the Woman in the Window" with Amy Adams. And uh, Julianne Moore and Gary Oldman, all these Academy Award level actors, and it's a, you know it's supposed to be a takeoff on Rear Window, so it's got Hitchcockian influences, and it's the biggest piece of trash you've ever seen. It's you know th- they should have closed the curtains barely on the window. A movie. It's, like it's barely, barely put a together. movie, and you know I'm watching that going, how, how you know. I, I, Roger used to say this too. It takes a group of really really talented people to make a memorably bad film because if it's just bland. <laughs> If it's just a mediocre rom-com or a second-rate, you know, knockoff Bruce Willis action film, all right, fine. You know, they all kind of knew what they were doing. This movie, I guarantee you, the day one, they go, let's get some Oscars. Let's go with this. And that one I gave, like, one star because, yeah, it was aspirational. And when when it misfired, it really misfired. I see a horror film that's made on a low budget and, you know, mm-hmm. borrows a lot of scares from a lot of other movies, but still, you know, gave me 90 minutes of involvement because the dog went out to examine the barking or the noise and the poor dog always gets it first in the horror movie. It's the worst thing ever. And then there's the one room in the set. Don't go down there. Well, of course, they're going to go down there. And it turns out that the country home was built on the site of an orphanage that was burned. We know all that stuff's going to happen. But I'm going to, you know, if it, if it does all of that effectively, I'm going to give it a recommendation. Does yeah. it mean it's a better quality film in terms of the production values and the acting than The Woman in the Window? No, but it succeeded at what it wanted to be. What's up, everybody? If you're watching this on video, you see that we have the beef kits right in front of us. These awesome blue and white striped kits. Awesome packaging, by the way. Like people, like the contents inside are very good. Don't get me wrong, but... This box is really sweet. It's got the J.P. Graziano Classic logo with the Barstool Stars and Stripes. It's really sweet. But anyways, the beef kit, you guys know the drill by now. Go to TasteRealChicago.com. Go get your beef kit. It's the perfect time to do so. They're fully stocked up, so it's only going to take a couple days to get to you. So if you want beef this weekend, there's a chance it gets to you. You could have beef this weekend. So go do that. TasteRealChicago.com. You can get your Mezzo Jardinera and your Italian beef seasoning. It's dummy proof. We've, we've been saying that the whole time. Anybody could do it. The directions are on the side of the bottle. So go do that, tastefulchicago.com. Go get your beef kit. Have a nice weekend. And, uh, yeah, do that right now, tastefulchicago.com. That's what I always say because uh, we mention, and there's a couple recent examples too, when I rate a movie, I'm rating the movie within the context of what it's supposed to be. Yep. Godzilla vs. Kong is a great example yep. of that. I thought for what Godzilla vs. Kong was supposed to be, I think I gave it like, I, I want to say around 80-ish. Yep. It was similar to another movie it. that, yeah, Probably better made, better acted. And I got that question, like, you think it's on par with that? I go, well, for what these two movies are supposed to be, they're two totally different things. Yeah, yeah they, they they kind of are. Like, if you're going to make a movie that's supposed to be campy and stupid, and it nails it and does it well, and, like, that's kind of how you're supposed to view it, then 
Yeah, I'm gonna have it up there. Like, I get this with comedy. It's like not another teen movie. I think is an incredibly well done parody. Yeah, movie, right. It, I but it's thought a, about it's, that one in a while. It's yeah. a, and I watched it recently. Man, does it hold up? And you're like, yeah, yeah. Is it maybe as nuanced as some other comedies out there? No, but no. for what it's supposed to be, totally, it's fucking excellent. Scary like, they, movie. They crush it. Yeah, scary right? movie. Yeah, yeah. that's why yeah. the ones after that. Like, I'll compare scary movie one to like. The other ones down the line, which were no, no, meet the Spartans, right? That's that's yeah, where yeah, you start yeah. comparing. Yeah, oh, man, that's so true, though. With you know, I agree with you know, and people with you know, with Godzilla versus King Kong. I even had people say, "Well, what's it about?" I go, "It's about Godzilla, and he goes up against King Kong." There are some titles of movies that tell you the entire movie, yeah, and we know yeah. that, and that's what we're leading up to. And of course, all of the rest is nonsense. But it was really well done, and it was a great movie. For people to get back into the theaters and watch it with the surround sound. In it. People are like, what about the characters? Well, the character development is it's, got, yeah. it's Godzilla and Kong. Those are the Kong characters. Kong was the third most complicated <laughs> character in the film. Yeah, yeah. I and, just think uh, it's something that people will never understand. Like, they'll never get through. I, I was reading, you know, just knowing you were coming in today, I was reading, you know, uh, Roger's Wikipedia, and he said, you know, there was, I'm not comparing Speed to, you know, yeah. Sandra Bullock on a cruise ship to American Beauty. You know, there, there's, a, there's a different layer to things, and I just don't. I don't know. I just don't know. You know, to me, it's like, I, I, for some reason, people with movies, they want to lump them all together. And I'm like, listen, if you go to a, a you know, a steakhouse in Chicago or New York, you know, that's got a great reputation and it's going to cost everybody $200 and the wine's marked up 50 bucks and everything, you have certain expectations. If you go through the drive through at Wendy's or McDonald's, yeah. you're looking for something else. And sometimes that McDonald's is going to be more satisfying because that's what you want and that's what you expect. Yep. So you don't compare those two and go like, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but that tomahawk steak that's $178 at Gibson's in Chicago is way better than the Wendy's cheeseburger. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, yeah. I'm, and you know what? I'm, I'm someone who I, I do like the slop here and there, though. You know, I do. Uh, yeah. I'm a sucker for bringing the characters back. I'm still clamoring for another Goonies, and I just want give me Josh yeah. Brolin oh, and so those you workout slop. shorts. You, you know say what I mean? Slop. Like, like the slop, I like. You know, I yeah, I love really, really bad movie. Not even like so bad. It's yeah. good. Like I like that recent one. Uh, uh, Silk Road. I watched that like three times. Yeah. It was so bad. I, I and it was and and I told stuff. They're like, oh, like so bad. It's good. I'm like, no, no, not even close to so bad. It's good. Like I just, I love a really, I love a good zero. Like I just, I, <laughs> yeah. I live for that one or two zero a year. I'm like, I hated that Absolutely. so much. But I almost love it like that much. There's one coming out uh, this week. I think it's called The Misfits, and it's a heist movie. And Pierce Brosnan is this career thief, he, and he still Pierce Brosnan still looks great. No, no, nobody has looked better for the last thirty-five years as the guy at the bar with a, with a drink <laughs> in his hand than Pierce Brosnan in the suit and the open collar shirt. Right, That's a good point. So he's playing this long-time career thief, and then there's this band of younger thieves, and they're all Robin Hoods. They want to steal money from this horrible Arab sheik who's got terrorist ties, and they're going to steal gold from him. And Nick Cannon leads this bunch, you know, and he he somehow even when they're in five-star hotels manages to only wear a sleeveless t-shirt so we can see how buff Nick Cannon is and he narrates the story and of course there's a multicultural band of thieves and we know there's going to be twists and turns and everything and it's it's unbelievably bad in terms of the you know what it's all about and it's so much fun it looks great it, and they're stealing every kind of little Ocean's Eleven trope and all these other things but you know when they're making it they're going like this is going to be fun yeah, let's mm -hmm. just do this. And if you go back and look at it, none of it makes sense. And then you've got like Tim Roth shows up at the villain. So again, sometimes when you're seeing these great actors slumming it, woman in the window, they weren't slumming it. They thought they were doing a prestige oh, yeah. project. Misfits, they know they're making a silly heist movie that they all got a nice paycheck and they got to film it overseas and, and probably had as much fun making it as a lot of other films because nobody's taking it seriously. Do you have a worst movie? I guess that, yeah, that people would that's, know. Yeah, yeah, that's tough, Eddie. You know, that again, it kind of goes back to what the film is trying to do. And, and, and for me, the films that I've given like zero stars to are the films that like exploit violence toward children, revel, you know, torture porn was the mm -hmm. term. And, you know, I know the Saw franchise and they just did another one, Book of Spiral. I don't know what the fuck, I don't know what Chris Rock was thinking. He wanted to do a horror film. He could have got it in his pick of, a-list horror thriller scripts and he, he kind of rebooted the the saw franchise and that's an example of one you know where, where they zoom in on close-ups of mutilations and stuff i don't know i'm not saying saw's the worst movie because it's actually it's pretty well made the first one you know danny glover's in it but that type of film 
where, you know, and, and again, films that put children in danger just to show them being hurt or to kind of yank us around. Those are the films that I'm that I'm going to give zero stars to because they're not only terrible, but I feel like they're in some cases morally bankrupt because mm-hmm. yeah, the filmmakers know what they're doing mm-hmm. and they're still doing it to try to get people into th- into theaters. Do you have one, Jeff? Other than asking you, knew mine. I'm I'm very public about mine typically. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we're friends. So I, yeah, yeah. I think Emoji Movie, is that yours? No, Emoji Movie's close. <laughs> um, but that's, no, it's, it's, a, it's a, the, the, my, my lowest. So on the website, if you go on it, it's like 5,000, like three. It's Jack and Jill with Adam Sandler. I think it's the worst movie. I think it's so, it's yeah. the, the, the product placement of what they do in that movie and watching fucking Al Pacino dance in that Dunkin' Donuts commercial. Wow. It is, it, it, it's, <laughs> I, I've that was the angriest I've ever been watching a movie because it just yeah. felt like you were being and I and I and I love Adam Sandler too like it's not even an Adam Sandler thing like I mean and I'm I'm like number one uncut gems defender logged on like I love uh, me too. so much me too. but man Jack and Jill felt like you were being exploited it just it felt yeah. so wrong I think I had it whatever year that came out it's probably what 2004 or something I don't know somewhere in the 2000s I think I had it as the worst movie of the year so I'm with you on that they're, they're on a green screen with uh, Johnny Depp in a Lakers game it wasn't even an actual Lakers yeah. game it was like uh, it just that, felt and, and that was uh, the thing that's the thing about Adam Sandler and uh, you know he's had listen he's had a great career uh, but there was that certain period there after he had the, you know the 90s you know resurgence after SNL and you know cuz he got fired from SNL or didn't get brought back you know and then he did you know Happy Gilmore and and Billy Madison and all these films that still you know people love to this day and then he got in the zone where he could make anything he wanted and he just you know he was the only guy that would show up for a movie in cargo shorts and a t-shirt and go well I'll, my character wears this and they the wardrobe would be like yeah, but he's playing an insurance salesman <laughs> and he just got that lazy and I'm with I'm with Jeff on this though because it, it it was such a disrespect to the audience and condescending and cynical to say like I can do any and getting these big stars who were thinking well I'm gonna be in an Adam Sandler movie this you know everyone seems to love him and he did Gino. so many of those and you know you would see every once in a while you'd see Spanglish or you'd see Uncut Gems even to this day and you see the talent that he's got and he still you know he's got this deal with Netflix now to keep making movies and he just did the. The Halloween thing last year, uh, that was horrible too. And he's going back to doing that weird, ridiculous six. Yeah, and he's doing the, the you know the weird voice and everything. And it's like you don't have to do anything anymore. You know why not just do uncut gems every once in a while? And, and it, it, listen, he always gives his friends. You know they all, hey, come on back, Rob Schneider. You the, know the you, wrong you, Missy. They had a nice vacation in Hawaii. Yeah, that one I there's, saw. There's yeah. a lot where it's like, where did he want to go on vacation? That's the old Michael Caine joke, of course, not joke, but story. You know that he would always say, you know, where's well, the movie set? And they'd say, well, you know, it's Jaws three, but we're going to be in the Bahamas for two months. He's on. He's in. You know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, Jack and Jill. I would have to say I. Bottom ten for me as well. Dunkachino. I, I, I did. That's I have to haunt Al Pacino. That just I, it's unbelievable. You think so? You well, think what's yours? I, the worst one that always sticks out to me is because I saw it in theaters. Because I'm big. Like, oh, if I if I paid really a ticket to go see it, now yeah, one missed call is pretty bad. One missed call. You, you ever seen that? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah, pretty yeah. bad. I get the, I get that. Yeah. My but there's buddies, a lot of bad horror. My movies, buddies say so. the happening. That one I gets brought up to me a lot because people actually saw it in theaters because it was M Night and it's sort of like if the Quiet Place went horribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. The happening. Yeah, yeah. There's well, my I think my favorite Roger review because I, I again I, I like bad movies. Mm-hmm. I, I love like the concept. I I think look at it and we we have a, a box of DVDs of bad movies and Casablanca at work that we use as props every now and then. Like, yeah. Meet the Spartans is in there. Um, Kirk Cameron Saves Christmas is in there. That's <laughs> one. You want a movie. Um, yeah. He, yeah. Uh, but Home Alone 3 is in there, which is yeah. my favorite. Like, Because yeah. he, he loved Home Alone 3, and Home Alone 3 is one of the most fascinatingly bizarre movies wow. of any franchise ever. Have you ever looked at the synopsis for Home Alone compared to Home Alone 3? No. It's, I have to read it out loud. It's pretty out there. It's it's it's. This is like I could I could do like a spoken word performance on this. <laughs> I think it's it's one of my favorite, and it's it's honestly it's it's really not as bad as I feel like because people you know people kind of clown it because there's no Macaulay Culkin. We tweet it every Christmas, I think, from from the podcast. Oh yeah, because I don't think like listen, it's definitely not one or two. I don't think it's the worst, the number three, but I it's don't know. it's um. <laughs> have you seen it? What? No, I haven't. It's, uh, it's oh the movie the number three Home Alone three yes yeah. yes yes yeah okay so Home Alone this is the Home Alone three synopsis I mean Home Alone one synopsis is probably like what 
kid, kid left at home fights off burglars. Yep. Four internationally wanted thieves working for a North Korean terrorist organization is a $10 million missile cloaking computer chip at an airport. I mean, just the, the <laughs> level of, I mean, from, from, from guys breaking in and, and flooding the basements, it's a, 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 a miss. And they the wet bandits to Korean <laughs> terrorists. Jeez. It's the, I mean, the, movie, the movie starts off in Korea and like they're wow. talking about chips. They almost kill an old woman in the movie. It's oh, unbelievable. Yeah. This time it's personal. <laughs> miss Hess. That, I, I almost guarantee you, I would bet. That that's a case where someone wrote a script and then someone said, you know, remember yeah. that action movie script? Let's dust it off and make it a Home Alone movie. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. they'll do that sometimes where you're like, how does that even you know fit into the world? And it's like, well, they already bought the rights to this thing. But it's I love that you, you told a story about like Rod with like, like Ben Stiller and stuff and like the, the types he'd be like a little harsher on things because in that review of Home Alone 3, he kind of craps in the first two and it's just like this, this was the one right here and it's so it's so pure and genuine that it's it's one of my favorite reviews well you know and i listen i you know the first home alone i i completely get first of all you know john hughes uh you know the screenplay it's one of the great titles of all time because it it, it uh, instantly every kid has that moment of fear when they thought they were left home alone i mean it's just and it is a great setup and macaulay culkin it's one of the best performances by a kid before he became yeah. aware of him being macaulay culkin but I do remember, and if it, it was Roger, it might have been Gene Sisko, but I think it was more Roger, and they pointed this out, and it's true. It's an ex it's a really violent film, like the like the stuff he yeah. does to those bandits is it should die. I mean, it's it's Roadrunner stuff, except for it's live action. So when you see it now in retrospect, you're like, geez, you know, it's like <laughs> it's really nasty stuff, man. <laughs> they should die. I think somebody said there's like they a should, YouTube they would video die like where seven, it's like, yeah, the seven times, yeah, they yeah. Should die. Totally. Hey, let's take a quick break here to talk about Roman, everybody. Stop with the old hacks. Stop with saying the Pledge of Allegiance in your head. Stop with counting backwards from 10. Stop everything else that you're doing because you got Roman here that can help you out. You don't need to do any of that shit anymore. You got this nice little swipe before you're about to do it. You rip it off. You put it on. You let it dry. You're good to go. That's it. It doesn't transfer to your partners. You don't got to worry about that. There's not going to be some like, oh, my God, what did you put on? What is, what is this? They won't even know. You know, it's just going to be something. It's basically an additive to make things better in the bedroom. And that's all it is. OK. And the best part, like I said, is discreet. Even the packaging is discreet. It's going to come to an unmarked package. Nobody will even know what it is. So go get it. It's to get Roman.com slash walk. You get your first month of swipes for just five dollars when you choose a monthly plan. That's get Roman.com slash walk. I don't know what more I have to say anymore. You need Roman. Everybody needs Roman. Get Roman.com so just walk. Go do it. Go enhance the sex life. All right, let's hop back into the show. Do you have something that's in uh that's been in development hell that you really have always wanted to get made? Is there that one movie you're like, man, that sounds good. Why can't it why can't it happen? Oh, that's a great question. I'd have to go back and look. I mean they've the one that immediately comes to mind is the Devil in the White City. Yeah. Which is, you know, based on this great book. And if people don't know about the, the World's Fair in Chicago, I believe it was 1893. And they literally created this white city. You know, and a sidebar about this, uh, L. Frank Baum, uh, the aspiring author, went with his family on vacation uh, to the white city at the World's Fair and was inspired in The Wizard of Oz to create the Emerald City of The Wizard of Oz. That was based on him seeing the white city exhibit but while that was going on in chicago there was this doctor who might have been the most prolific serial killer in the history of this country they don't know many how many dozens if not hundreds of young women he murdered because he ran a boarding house and all these 17 18 19 year olds even younger would come from iowa or minnesota or oklahoma to the big city maybe hoping to get a job at the world's fair and he'd bring them into his home which reportedly had this incredible catacombs and death chambers and torture chambers so it's a fascinating book about you know these two things happening in chicago and they've been talking about making it into a movie forever uh scorsese directing tom cruise attached at one point and i keep reading that it's going into production but then i talk to people in the chicago and illinois film office and they go not to our knowledge and it still hasn't because mm -hmm. to me it actually sounds just from the description if people get a chance to read the book it might work better as a Netflix eight-part series. Something that complex, yeah. Yeah, with that much going on. But I think it has, it sounds like to me like something that would be an incredible visual spectacle because it could have the combination of like this historical epic and then a chilling horror film wrapped inside of it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I've always been fascinated by that because it's here and everything like that. Yeah, so yeah. I think it wasn't Leo rumored to be playing it yeah, too. Yeah, it was and, you the, know, and, and you know, the, you you think about you know DiCaprio and Scorsese like the perfect combination because you could see DiCaprio yeah. as this charming doctor who has this evil side. We've seen that in some of the films he's done, you know, mm-hmm. Tarantino films and things like that as well, that he could play that dark side. I'll go much dumber. I wish they would have made the 21 Jump Street Men in Black crossover. <laughs> I really would, because I'm, I'm such a Jump Street guy, and that sounded like a great way to do it, like to an excuse to do another one, and then they did, and they made that crappy Men in Black movie instead. So <sighs> that was a, Yeah, that's another one where, like, you know, leave it alone. Yeah, just, you know. T- ten, who was, who was banging on the doors? Like, come like, on. Yeah, no, well, no, it's not like yeah. Men in Black 3 was... No, it had already really like, fallen off. Yeah. But, but again, you know, that, that's the thing when, you know, going back to Eddie's original question, you know, there's still this tendency in Hollywood to not take a chance on that original screenplay for The Devil in the White City that's going to cost $200 million and say, let's throw $150 million at a movie that we could put Men in Black in the title and just redo yeah. it again. And thank God for the streaming and other platforms that will take on these prestige projects. Have you ever been accused? I know one of the funniest things I think going with LCB is they uh, they're always accused of being at Disney's pockets, yeah, right? People we're always big, think we're that big, you're Disney show people. That yeah. Disney is always like, giving them some side chance. Do you have anyone that's always accused you? Oh, of I, I hear from people all the time saying the studios must have paid you off, and you know I've actually worked for Disney or for some subsidiary of Disney for most of the last twenty some years. Uh, you know, Ebert and Roper was originally. An independent show, well, Siskel and Ebert, and then was, you know, Tribune Company. But by the time I got there, it was Buena Vista Television, which is owned by Disney. So we, you know, we got checks with the mouse on them. And I will say this, the whole time I was there, almost a total of nine years, they made it very clear. Michael Eisner was the chairman at the time, uh, made it very clear that there was a separation of church and state, that no one from anyone involved in a Disney movie was ever to contact us other than in normal capacity to say, hey, let's set up a screening and would never be any repercussions because... The value of the franchise was you could trust us. And I always point to the fact that I, there's a movie, I think it was called Sahara, and it was directed by Michael Eisner's son. And I gave it thumbs down on the show. And it, Roger gave it thumbs up, and I'm like, okay, if you liked it, you liked it. And afterwards, he's like, you got some balls on you. And I said, it's not a good movie. And we mm. never heard a word from Disney. So on a Disney-owned show, I ripped a movie by the son of the chairman of Disney. Uh, but I hear it all the time, too, from people. And I'm like, first of all, if you think that Universal Pictures is rolling out the big wads of dough for me <laughs> to give a positive review to something, it's it just... I always say, it. please. Yeah, yeah. For lo- if, you, if they want to throw money in my pocket to say that whatever thing they just put out on Disney Premiere, go for it. Yeah. How uh, much did they pay you? You get that <laughs> a lot. And the other one is, did you even see this movie? <laughs> like... Yes, that's the rule. I have to see it and then review it. Well, it doesn't seem to me like you saw the movie. Is it worse now with social media? Yeah. Uh, And it's just, you know, again, people could still reach out to me with email. The truth is I don't respond to much of those either because you can't win, you know. And yeah, well, everybody's a critic now, and that's fine. You know, everybody's emboldened to have their opinion. But I'll put a review out there, and there's 600 replies. First of all, who has the time? You know, I just don't have the time to go through that. And I, you know, what am I going to do? If someone says this or that, the only, a few times I'll reply if someone just says something that's, you know, factually wrong. You know, they'll say, this movie got that (laughs) wrong about this. Or they'll say, well, you're also the guy that gave a negative review to the, and I'll be like, that's not true. Here's a link to my four-star review. They never answer, though. They never go, oh, my God, you set true. me right. I'm so sorry. I'm going to spend $10 to the charity of your name to make it up to you. So even that, you know, they just go they just go silent then, or they unfollow you if you, if you prove them but wrong. But it's also yeah. few and far between, too, I feel like. I, I like a good discussion if someone just completely disagrees with me. But it's like you said earlier. It's like the one or two word, like, it's like stupid or idiot. It's like, all right, well, I'm, I, don't, I don't You could not... You could, if you want to call me an idiot and then idiot comma two more tweets as to why I disagree, then I'll probably reply. Yeah, to that. Like, yeah. If, you, if you think I'm an idiot, that's apt. I am. That's fine. But yeah. you know, if you want to have an actual discussion, I'll like. Yeah, that's what the platform's for, right? You know. There's another thing where people will say, "I'll never trust you again because you <laughs> liked a certain movie that they hated." And they're like, you know, you've lost. They love saying this. You've lost all credibility with me, my wife and I. And it's always the guy, basically. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Went to see blah, 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 because you gave it three and a half stars. 
We walked out after 10 minutes. First of all, you didn't say there was going to be subtitles and there's reading and whatever the reason is, but they'll say, you lost all credibility. And I can't help sometimes respond and say, so what you're saying is I've done roughly 11,000 film reviews over the years. And because we disagree on this one, <laughs> this is it. I've lost all credibility that everything I've done. And it's like, why would you want to just agree with me on every single thing? That's insane, too. So. Yeah. Well, Richard, thanks for coming in today. My pleasure. Yeah. It, so what's going on? You got a new podcast as well? Yeah, new podcast with my longtime radio partner, Rokan. Uh, Chicago area listeners will know him. It's called Screen Time. And it is just about what we've been talking about. Anything you can see on a screen but primarily movies and then the streaming shows as well and it's as you guys well know it's available everywhere you know when people say where's your, your podcast available I go why don't you google it there you go yeah, you know, yeah, but it's, you know, it's available everybody it's called screen time mm -hmm. we're doing it twice a week now uh, it's fun because we do the deep dives into films talk you know if it's a, we recently did about a, a show on the 35th anniversary of running scared a great buddy cop movie and got Billy Crystal on to talk about it we had James Kahn on recently to talk about uh, Thief and believe it or not guys the 50th anniversary of Brian's song is this fall. Mm, Maybe wow. the best football movie of all time. So, it would, you know, it's great to have, you know, Billy Crystal and James Kahn and, and the likes on. But mostly it's just my chance to kind of talk about what we just talked about. Get a little more deep dive on, on movies and, and streaming shows. Nice. Yeah, sure. You guys should get some great guests, like you said. Awesome. Uh, Jeff, anything else? No. No. MovieRankings.net. How about I, that? I have some movies to catch up on. You I should go out. back and look at that Jack and Jill. I want to see what you had just ahead of it. Like at number 5,002. I mean, you know? I, have, and I have to answer You should now. check out his site, Richard. It's I have. Yeah, I, have. I, have. Oh, have? Yeah. I have to answer yeah. what, what the second to last one is. I want to say it's actually a newer movie. That I I would be very curious if you, because no human should have watched this. <laughs> Cher was in it. Cher lent her voice in it. Very recently. came out last year. I... I might have been one of ten people to see this movie. I'm pretty sure this is my this is my second to last. And it's a share of Bobbleheads one? the movie. It was a movie of yeah. talk because <laughs> you know bobbleheads are are they're, that's the toy everyone talks about. Just like the Legos, you know Lego obviously still relevant. Bobbleheads though, uh, Cher lent her voice oh, no. to it. They didn't have the rights to her music obviously, uh, and, and I th I think that may actually be be second to last. Second to last. Like but they, they, they had Jack and Jill as the cushion as they were plummeting yeah, they to did. earth there. Yeah. Bobbleheads. And again, you know that was a studio meeting. All right, they've already done Lego. Can we get Operation the movie? Yeah, uh, don't Break the Ice. Bobbleheads. Yeah. And somebody got a bonus. How much did they pay that? Cher? It's like, yeah. does she even know she was in it? Did <laughs> some, <you> know, <laughs> I mean, did they just put something in front of her one day, you know, at the salon and she read 30 lines? <laughs> oh Probably. You guys are just two people who have just seen some shit. Like you know, that's it. the Love thing, it, and though. I always say that, Eddie, because people say, man, you get to see every movie, and I go, no, I have to see every movie. It's both. It's both. <laughs> well, that's, and I'll say it, because then, then we'll wrap. Yeah. But, but no, no, no. I don't want to keep it going, You're but good. that is the <laughs> that is the other thing that gets me, is I will always reply to when someone says, blank is the worst movie I've ever seen, and I always say, the worst you've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. That like that that movie, and it'll be like something like very basic. It'll be like the new Conjuring movie, right? Like that's the worst yeah. you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than that. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, very I get a lot of that, and moment. it's like a three-year-old yeah. saying, "This is my favorite film ever." It's like <laughs> yeah. Piglet's movie. That's you've seen two <laughs> movies, kid. You know, Bobblehead's the movie though. And then actually, uh -huh. my last question too: Would you are you worried about movie theaters? Is it? Did you, are you like the yeah. streaming in demand? Do you I, like I, this? I, I do like it, and you know. Uh, you look at something uh, like In the Heights, Lin-Manuel Miranda, we talked about him. His first big Broadway hit was In the Heights, and it's, it's coming to theaters on Friday, and it's also going to be straight to HBO Max. And to me, it's two different audiences. And same thing with Cruella. It was 30 bucks, and people go, oh, my God, $30 to watch at home. Well, if you're a young couple and you've got three kids, that's a bargain, 30 bucks, compared yeah. to what you'd have to do because you know, if, if the kids are old enough to bring them there, maybe you get a sitter for the younger kid going to the theater concessions and stuff. So I feel like the streaming platform is, is helping more than it's hurting, and the theater owners are finally starting to get that. Now, Quiet Place Part 2, uh, John Krasinski said, I want a 45-day window. You know, So it's in theaters for 45 days, then it's going to come to streaming. People are starting to go back to theaters. Quiet Place 2 you know, did very well. I think some of these other films coming out, we're going to eventually get the Top Gun movie and Black Widow. So theaters are, th are going to bounce back in a big way. I think. Not, not that... 
I said this too, and I don't know if you agree with this. I think too, because we were forced out for so long, yeah. it almost, I, I hate saying it helped, like it helped it because I mean, would COVID really help? But I think it almost helped people realize like, oh shit, I really missed the movie. Like, yeah. like there's, there's people who I know who are going, who didn't go before because they're like, damn, like I really took that for granted. That, and especially in some of the genres we're talking about, the comedies, the action films, the superhero movies. I actually went back to see Avengers Endgame the weekend it opened. I'd seen it a month earlier because I wanted to watch it with the fans. Mm-hmm. And here's something I've told parents uh, of, you know, adolescents and teenagers for generations now. Your kids not only want to go to the movies, they want to get away from you. They want to go somewhere. And the movies is the first. That's the first thing when a kid is 12, Mm -hmm. 13. It's the first thing they can do where mom or dad drops them off at the mall or the multiplex and picks them up in two and a half hours. And they get to meet their friends and have that cool going out experience. It's been that way since the fucking 20s, you know, and always will be. So theaters, I think, are going to, and I think Jeff is true, too. People really miss that experience. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. I definitely. I'm happy it's back. Then you gotta fix your pretzel bites in the local. I theater. know. It's the Rosemont one's oh, killing come me. Come on, the Rosemont one. You that should that be one? A, a criminal offense. And they got people in Rosemont that know how to enact. I know uh, legislation. It's a problem. If you're listening, to Rosemont, you're stop with the pretzel bites. They're just cutting up the Bavarian, Richard. That's come on. You can't do that's, that. That's, that's, that's just, it. It's a big problem. Listen, they got to get their game back on too. It's been a while. They got to get back in stride. You know, they're like a guy coming off a rehab. You know, assignment in AAA. He's gonna get his get his arm back. Don't worry. Yeah, about it. they really are. Uh, Richard, thanks again. Screen time. Go listen to it. Go download it. Uh, this was fun. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, Eddie. that's it for today, everybody. We'll see you next time.